Improvisation is terrifying. <laughs> improvisation is terrifying for a whole bunch of reasons. Improvisation is terrifying because you have to do it spontaneously. You have to, when you're improvising, by definition, you're working off the top of your head. Uh, kind of like I'll be doing more or less for the next 17 minutes or so. Um, improvisation is terrifying because not only are you working off the top of your head, but especially in a musical scenario, uh, you're working off the top of your head, um, often in front of a whole bunch of people. Um, improvisation is terrifying because you're working off the top of your head in front of a whole bunch of people, uh, usually by yourself. When we're talking about jazz performance in particular, we often talk, we use the words improvisation and soloing, sometimes somewhat interchangeably. Um, so you're not always playing by yourself, but you're often playing by yourself. So you're making stuff off the top of your, up, you're making stuff up off the top of your head, you're doing it by yourself, you're in front of a whole bunch of people, so that's a real nexus of terror. <laughs> There's a whole lot of fear, potentially, that's going on in that scenario, uh, especially for novice improvisers. So in my jazz ensemble, in my improvisation classes, uh, one of the first things that we have to do is figure out how to encounter that anxiety, how to encounter that feeling of exposure and vulnerability that students potentially have, or in fact, not potentially have, definitely have, um, <clears throat> in, this, in this kind of situation. So, uh, and the, the work becomes trying to figure out how to transition that feeling of vulnerability and feeling of anxiety uh, into something that's not uh, paralyzing, but into something that's potentially productive. Uh, so one of the first steps that we take is to, is to, is to figure out how students can recognize that it's something that, that, that those feelings of anxiety and vulnerability are, are things that virtually everybody shares. Uh, if, it's, if, if, if you're not feeling vulnerable and anxious in, in the particular moment as an improviser, it's likely something that you recall pretty viscerally, pretty vividly. I certainly recall the first moments that I tried to improvise uh, as, a, as, a, as a jazz saxophonist when I was 12 or 13 and feeling that kind of terror, um, feeling that kind of fear um, when I you know, tried to step up in front of a bunch of people and, and, and do my thing. And it's, a, it's, it's not something you easily forget. So. Um, that this, does, this does a number of things. We, 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 work on, um, we work on getting students to admit publicly to the, to the, to the, to the anxiety that they're feeling in and of, them, in and of themselves, and reciprocally to, to recognize that there's a shared feeling of anxiety, and a, in fact, a mirrored feeling of anxiety and vulnerability in the students around them. And so the vulnerability that had been a, a, an isolated kind of experience, a, a, a unique and individuated kind of experience, becomes something that's distributed. And that creates a pretty powerful and pretty intimate bond. When you realize that everybody around you is feeling more or less the same way, that really bring, can bring a group, can bring a collective much closer together. Uh, so that um, certainly goes some distance towards mitigating that feeling of isolation. When you realize that you're not alone with, in, with, with your anxiety, that you're, you're, you're working together with a group that's all, that's all dealing with similar situation in, at, a, at a similar point in time, um, you're, the, the feeling of isolation is, is, uh, is, is, is minimized to some degree anyway. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing that it does as a counterpoint to that is that, e is that uh, it, it raises the stakes in terms of your desire and your need potentially to, to take care of the other, the other improvisers in the group. When you recognize some, a, a kind of fear that you're feeling, um, you have a much greater degree of empathy for, for, for your recognition of that fear in somebody else. Uh, Emma Kelty Stevens and I were talking earlier about our, the, the sympathy that she was feeling having given one of these TED Talks last year <laughs> um, for all of the speakers this year and recognizing that the, 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 the moments of, of anxiety and the moments of crisis and also the, 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 moments, of, the moments of power and the moments of joy that can, that can come off in, those, in, in, these, in these kinds of interchanges. Having that relatability and having that, dis that distribution of, of, of structures of feeling creates a, a powerful bond and a powerful kind of relationship. So what happens, uh, ideally anyway, what, what we try to get to happen is that something that starts out as a very individual, a very isolated kind of crisis, um, a musical crisis potentially, and, and, a, and a crisis of emotion, a crisis of feeling, can turn into a, a, a kind of collective solidarity, from an individual crisis to a collective solidarity. So, where is all of this happening? It's happening effectively in the, what, what we talk about a lot in the jazz ensemble or in my improvisation classes, in the space in the middle. Um, 
and I mean that kind of literally. In, in my ensemble rehearsals, we set up in a circle. We set up in the round. Um, <clears throat> so all of the sounds that are being projected into the space are literally being projected into the space in, in the middle. And so the work that we do in the ensemble has everything to do with cultivating that space in the middle. And evidently, uh, a lot of the work has to do with working on musical stuff. So in the case of Ascension, for instance, uh, we worked on certain melodic ideas, like do da do do dum this phrase that you maybe heard at the beginning of the, of the, of the clip. Um, Ascension, evidently, was the two-minute clip or so that you heard at the beginning of this presentation. Um, do da do do dum do da do do dum this is a lick that everybody has to play, has to learn to play together. And there are certain rhythmic ideas that we all had to, that we all had to learn and we all had to work on. Uh, but a, a lot of the work that we do, and in fact, the first work that we do, has to do first and foremost with listening. We work primarily and initially on listening, and more specifically on finding a balance between listening and speaking, or maybe between making sound and not making sound, and using listening as a way to undergird that, that balance as the fulcrum between those two, those two things. Uh, we talk a lot about how uh, about the, the ethics of contributing or choosing not to contribute to your sound to that space in the middle and what that choice to contribute or not contribute means in terms of both taking care of the music that we're all making together and also taking care of the other musicians that are, that are, that are, that are contributing. Because sometimes maybe you find that there's a, there's a moment that there's an idea that you have in a, in a, in a, collective, in a collective improvisation that uh, is really going to add something substantial to the to the mix, and you have an intentional uh, an intentional feeling that this gesture is going to do something important. Um, but the last thing that you want to do is just sort of play because because you've got a horn in your mouth <laughs> or you've got a guitar in your hands. Because in a case like this Ascension piece that we played, and I, I think that some of you maybe were at this concert on September 23rd, um, where we played this tribute to John Coltrane on John Coltrane's 90th birthday. Um, in a case like Ascension, which is a 25-minute long collective improvisation. If everybody's playing full board the whole concert, uh, it's going to get really loud, really scronky, really fast. Uh, and that can be a little boring. <laughs> Certainly, it can be a little overwhelming, and probably a lot of people are going to leave. So it's not necessarily a, an entirely desirable phenomenon for everybody to be contributing without, without listening. But if we're, if we're thinking carefully about the moments that we're choosing to play and the moments that we're choosing not to play, then we're actively cultivating that space in the middle. And similarly, we might choose not to play because we want to ensure that some of our colleagues in the group are going to have room to contribute to the space. So we're, 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 we're listening to the space and we're also listening to the people around us to make sure that everybody, is, everybody has a chance to co-create. Because that's the other piece here, is that the space in the middle is a co-created space. In the same way that vulnerability is distributed uh, vulnerability is distributed within the group, within the group, and that kind of mitigates these anxieties and these fears that we might all be having, or at least um, turns turns them into it, it turns them into something that's potentially productive. So too is authorship and ownership of the music that we're making distributed. It's the thing that we're creating is something that is fundamentally shared. The process that we're engaging in together is something that's fundamentally shared. And so what we're working on, in effect, is something that is equally musical and social. Um, we're working on creating really good music, but in order to create really good music, we need to be empathetic. We need to listen carefully to one another. We need to think intentionally and carefully about what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. And when the, when the, um, the, the, the bonds of, the, the, when the relationships are working well, when the social situation is, 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 um, is, is beautiful, then the musical, the musical situation is going to be beautiful too. So evidently, where all of these tools and skills are equal parts musical and social, and in fact, um, where the musical and the social are coterminous, they're identical with one, to, to one another, the skills of, that are required of, a, of, a, of an effective improviser, the skills that are required to make improvisation beautiful and, and, and powerful, are the same tools that we need to be, um, to be, effective, people, <laughs> to be effective people in the world to be effective people in any kind of communicative, in, in any kind of scenario that's grounded by um, uh, dialogical exchange, that's grounded by dialogue and communication. Um, and there are other places, of course, where we can practice these tools and skills. And as it happens, many of these places are in uh, humanities and social science classrooms or liberal arts classrooms more broadly. Uh, we might think, in, I mean, in, in my classes, my improvisation class and my jazz ensemble, uh, the space in the middle happens to be a musical space. Uh, 
uh, and the, the aggregate of, of, of exchanges and contributions to that space are, are sounded contributions. But we might think, for instance, of a philosophy seminar as being another kind of space in the middle, where maybe the, the, the space in the middle is not a musical space, but instead it's a discursive space. And the contributions that are being made to the space from different points around a table, perhaps, aren't sounded instrumental contributions. They are ideas and words. And the, whereas in an improvised situation, we're thinking about how to negotiate consonance and dissonance and volume and, 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 and texture and timbre and these different kinds of ideas. Perhaps in the philosophy seminar, we're trying to think about how to reach some kind of consensus or how to negotiate uh, discrepancies between accord and discord, how to agree and disagree civilly and productively with one another. We could also think in a, in a much bigger scheme outside of the, outside of the college of democracy as being potentially uh, a kind of space in the middle, a bigger, messier, more complicated space in the middle with many more contributors, but nevertheless a communicative, uh, a communicative space. Uh, and this comes from John Dewey, among other people, but um, John Dewey in 1916 in his book Democracy and Education suggests a democracy is more than a form of government. It is primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience conjoint communicated experience. So democracy for John Dewey is not like the icons of democracy, the things that we might imagine to, to, that, that look fixed and permanent, like, uh, I mean, evidently with Tuesday coming up, the office of the president, or the rituals of democracy like voting, the things that are cyclical and routine and have a sense of permanence to them, um, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, things that look like they've been there forever and will be there forever, because democracy is a process. Democracy is never finished. Democracy is, democracy is something that is ongoing and something that we need to continue to work on. And, the, 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 and in, that respect, in that respect, citizenship, is, is, or our citizenship is, is kind of constitutive of the tools that are required, uh, the tools that we need to work on in order to make our democracy better. And to close the gap here, improvisation classes or perhaps humanities classes or perhaps liberal arts classes more broadly, are, are some of the key places where we're working on cultivating those tools, those tools of citizenship that can enrich and enliven our democracy. So what do we do about the crisis in humanities? What do we do when humanities are being routinely cut, be, being routinely uh, treated with contempt across the United States? And this is, this is, a, this is a, a, a widespread, a ubiquitous problem in the, in the world. Um, one of the characters of the, I mean, the, the main character, I guess, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the rhetorical crisis in the humanities, at least, is um, this sense that comes from people like Governor Pat McCrory in, in, in North Carolina that the value of an education period is to set students on a singular path towards a singular outcome. Uh, and the outcome is a job, and the singular path is constitutive of the skills that one needs to get that job. And any kind of schooling that doesn't, that isn't comprised of that kind of singular path, that doesn't contribute those singular skills, that doesn't result in, the, in that singular outcome, isn't a valuable kind of schooling. So Pat McCrory took on gender studies as, a, uh, as his particular target in 2013, shortly after being elected governor of North Carolina. Uh, if you want to take gender studies, Pat McCrory said in 2013, go to a private school and take it. But I don't want to subsidize that in the IE and the University of North Carolina public system. I don't want to subsidize that if it's, if it's not going to get someone a job. Uh, one can only wonder um, what, the, what North Carolina would look like if Pat McCrory had taken a few gender studies classes. Um, <laughs> but perhaps that's a conversation for another day. Uh, so concomitant with, the, with, with Pat McCrory's comments on, on gender studies uh, as an invalid, illegitimate uh, area of study, the University of North Carolina system has been veritably gutted since 2008. And evidently, this is a nonpartisan issue. Pat McCrory wasn't governor in 2008. Um, it was Democrats who, were, who held the gubernatorial office in 2008 and uh, were the, the primary agents of, that, uh, of, the, of, those, of the first $500 million or so of those, of those budget cuts. Uh, and we could look to many other places in the United States for this, for this kind of rhetoric and th these, these, kinds of, these kinds of material cuts. Um, but I'm just going to cherry pick a little bit because this is a recent episode. Uh, Matt Bevan, uh, the fairly recently elected governor of Kentucky, 
uh, has recently floated the idea that uh, that the budget the the budgetary appropriations to the Kentucky state system should be uh, conditional upon the, the, the extent to which graduates of given programs are finding work in the fields, in their given fields of study. So um, he suggests that um, there will be, quote, there will be more incentives to electrical engineers than French literature majors. There just will. All the people in the world that want to study French literature can do so. They're just not going to be subsidized by the taxpayer, courageously taking on French literature. Matt Bevan. Um, but again, this is not a partisan issue. Barack Obama has made similar comments uh, the, along, along these same, same lines. Speaking in 2014 at an event in Wisconsin, Obama encouraged, uh, encouraged young people at that event to consider uh, schooling in the trades, in, in, uh, in skilled manufacturing, over and above art history in this case. He suggested that students that, that, that took uh, apprenticeships uh, or other kinds of trade-based schooling were going to find better paying jobs and ultimately a better life than what they could find with an art history major. Uh, and he went on to suggest that he has a great deal of respect for art history, but that the implication is not so dissimilar from what we're getting from Pat McCrory, Matt Bevan, and many other characters in this mix. So when we're faced with a situation where humanities courses, social science courses, the liberal arts in general, are being routinely treated with such contempt from all of these higher offices in the United States. When we're faced with a situation where, when we're faced with a situation where humanities courses, where social sciences, where the liberal arts are routinely being defunded, being eliminated in many cases uh, across the United States, and when we remember that so much of the work of building rich, vibrant, democratic citizenship happens in these courses, it's little wonder that we find ourselves in the crisis of democracy that we find ourselves today. It's little wonder, perhaps, that the partisan, the partisan sniping in, in Washington has, uh, has uh, effectively ground the machinery of, of, of democracy to a halt. Perhaps, if, <laughs> if they were to study improvisation or study French literature a little bit, learn to listen, learn to dialogue productively a little bit better in a, in a humanities course, in a music improvisation course, uh, the uh, congressional representatives and senators would do a little bit better job of listening to one another. Um, it's little wonder, perhaps, that the American electorate, that uh, the citizens of the United States are increasingly looking towards a model of leadership that treats listening itself, that treats empathy itself with contempt, treats it as if it were a sign of weakness, as if it were a, a, a sign of indecision, rather than something that was evidence of thoughtfulness, of caring, and of conscientiousness. So. If democracy is a process, and if citizenship is a practice, is something that we need to continue to work on and to cultivate, what does it say about the work that we've been doing, or perhaps the work that we've been neglecting, that has allowed our democracy to get, our process of democracy to get to the point that it has? So when students come to me, or as often as not when their parents come to me, and ask me about the value of, a, of, of studying music, and about the value of studying improvisation, of course, the first thing that I tell them is that playing music and committing yourself to making music is one of the most, or, and, and for that matter, committing yourself to making art is one of the most important things that you can do in the world. Being true to that aspect of your humanity is critical, and con contributing beauty to the world is a critical part of, of, of making the world a, a better and more beautiful place. But the second thing that I say is that when you come and study improvisation, when you come and study jazz with me, you'll be working on listening and you'll be working on developing empathy, and you'll be working on, on, on considering the ethics of co-creation, because that is a lot of the work that we do in the humanities. And, that's, and in, in, in doing that work, we're working on cultivating the human bonds of citizenship. And so in doing that work, we're doing our part, I think, to help, and I don't think, that, I don't think this is exaggerating to say this, when we're doing that work, we're doing our part to heal the fissures and fractures that we see in this very broken and very damaged democracy in the United States. Thank you. <laughs>